Hello again everyone, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. Now, regardless of which side of the fence you're on about what shape the Earth is, one thing we all seem to be able to agree on is that surveying works. I don't mean the people who stand in the street with a clipboard asking you 95 different questions about your latest bowel movement. I'm talking about surveying using equipment such as theodolites to survey an area of land and get accurate measurements, which can then be used in things like engineering projects. Now, if engineering surveying wasn't accurate, then big engineering projects would quickly go very wrong. And in a recent video, I'd shown an excerpt from a surveying training website called Learn CST, which was run by the National Society of Professional Surveyors in America. And the webpage in question was called Curvature Definitions for Land Surveyors. And the last definition on that page was explaining how land surveyors include six centimeters of correction per one kilometer of measured distance to account for the curvature of the Earth. Obviously, that is something they wouldn't have to do if the Earth was flat. And in the video, I also included a demonstration that someone had done using a theodolite across a lake to show that the lake itself follows the curve of Earth. I even had a professional surveyor comment on that video to confirm that they do correct for Earth curvature. Despite all of that, though, there are still flat earthers that say surveyors don't correct for Earth curvature and that water is flat and level, etc, etc. Now, after that video, I actually had the head of a large surveying firm reach out to me privately to show me some more surveying material that they had that related to debunking flat Earth. And it comes from a book called Surveying for Engineers. So I went and bought myself a copy. It's nearly 600 pages long, and it is almost as brilliant for learning as Brilliant.org. Brilliant has hundreds of classes covering topics across maths, science, and computing. I've been using it now for months. In fact, at the time of me recording this, I'm currently up to a 98-day continuous streak. Each class teaches you the principles of a topic with interactive animations that I personally find makes it a lot easier to understand concepts. It's very relaxed as well. If you get a question wrong, it's not a problem. It breaks it down step by step on how to tackle a question so you know for next time. But for the more competitive amongst you, they've recently introduced leaks. You earn experience points for correctly solving problems, and the 15 people in each league who earn the most experience points for a given week will advance onto the next league. I'm currently on track to advance out of the Titanium League. So if you want to come and join me, then head on over to brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan to pick up a 30-day free trial. And be quick, because the first 200 people to do so can have 20% off an annual subscription. Like I said, this is Surveying for Engineering, which is about 600 pages that looks at, well, I'll just quote the back of the book. The text covers engineering surveying up to the end of most second year degree courses in civil engineering, building and construction, and is suitable for BTEC courses from level three. It's written by John Urin and Bill Price. Now, John Urin is a senior lecturer and currently deputy head in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Leeds, where he also obtained his PhD in civil engineering. Bill Price is a principal lecturer in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Brighton. He obtained his MSc in land surveying from University College London. Both authors have written several books and contribute frequently to journals associated with land and engineering surveying. There's been five editions of Surveying for Engineering. It was first published back in 1978, with a second edition then following in 1985. This is the third edition that was published in 1994. Uh, it was followed by the fourth edition in 2006, and then lastly, a fifth edition in 2010. Each new edition is intended as an update to keep up with new equipment and new practices. And it covers everything from understanding how to set up the equipment, how to use it, how to interpret the data, and so much more. Essentially, this is a book written by surveyors for the purpose of training new surveyors. It's not called How to Lie About the Shape of the Earth. And it contains several sections that are rather damning to flat earthers. And it's been in circulation for 45 years. So let's jump straight into chapter two, leveling. 
Section 2.1, level and horizontal lines. Now, flat earthers will say that level means flat and that water finds its own level, so therefore water and subsequently the earth is flat. Now, quote, the term level line and horizontal line are used frequently in leveling and need to be carefully defined. A level line or surface is defined as a line along which all points are the same height. Because the earth is curved, level lines are also curved as shown in figure 2.1. A horizontal line is one which is normal to the direction of gravity at a particular point, such as P in figure 2.2. .2. Horizontal lines or surfaces are therefore tangential to level lines at individual points. So what this means is that a horizontal line is a line that is perpendicular to the vertical line at any given point, and because the Earth is curved, then the vertical lines of two different locations won't be perfectly parallel to each other. And so the horizontal lines won't perfectly align with each other either. This is the basis of the theodolite demonstration, which I'd included in my other video. Put a theodolite and a target on either side of a lake and set them to the same height above the water line, if the lake is flat, then the horizontal measurement of the theodolite would mean it was pointing straight at the target. If the lake is curved, the target would sit below horizontal, which is what happens. A level line, by comparison, is judged as a line of which is equal height above mean sea level. And because the Earth isn't flat, then a level line doesn't match a horizontal line. The book then does expand on this further and highlights that, quote, for most survey work, the difference between a horizontal line and level line, called curvature, is small enough to be ignored and can be assumed that level and horizontal lines are the same. Now, before flat earthers rejoice and think then that they must be the same, let's get into section 2.17, which it highlights. This is errors in leveling, specifically the effects of curvature and refraction on leveling. So it talks about the calculations for correcting for curvature and then highlights that the deviation between horizontal and level is very small at distances under 120 meters, which is usually the sort of maximum distance that they would have between points used for leveling. But that curvature and refraction can't be ignored when calculating heights using theodolites as per section 3.11 which is height measurements by the theodolites, also known as trigonometrical heighting. This goes into explaining how you can measure the elevation angle above a horizontal line with a theodolite and then work out the height of an object. A process similar to a demonstration I'd done in response to a certain flat earther, who has subsequently since then tried twisting it and repeatedly claiming that I've proven the earth is flat, because apparently you can't measure angles from a curved surface. Well, these two pages completely debunk that notion, showing how surveyors measure angles based off a horizontal line from their position, but then correct for the fact that their horizontal position is not the same as the horizontal position for the target's location, by including some fancy-looking maths to correct for the amount of earth curve between the two locations. As stated here, Fg equals d squared divided by 2r, where R is the average radius of the Earth between points A and B. Confirming that we can measure angles on a curved surface, because if you know the radius of that curved surface, you can correct for it. And before any flat earthers claim that they're presupposing the R value, the very fact that using that particular R value produces consistently accurate results in any application it's used in validates that that value is correct. If we tried using an R value of 3,000 or 10,000 kilometers instead, the results that we got would become more and more inaccurate as distances increased. They apply more corrections based on Earth's radius as well. Section 5.23 looks at scale factor. This actually ties in rather nicely to another video I did recently about flat maps not being accurate. It states, as outlined in section 1.5, all ordnance survey maps and plans in Great Britain are based on a rectangular coordinate system known as the National Grid. For anyone unfamiliar, Ordnance Survey is the national mapping agency of the UK. 
first founded back in 1791, and through the 1800s it began surveying the entire United Kingdom in detail to produce Ordnance Survey maps. Even having Parliament in 1841 introduced the Ordnance Survey Act to allow surveyors the right to enter properties for the purpose of surveying the land within them. Nowadays, they sell these maps that cover the entirety of the United Kingdom in various scales right the way down to one to two and a half thousandth. And they've divided the UK into two lettered grid squares that are 500 kilometers by 500 kilometers to give area codes for their maps, which they call the National Grid. And Surveying for Engineers states that the National Grid is derived from a map projection which is a transverse Mercator projection with an origin of 2 degrees west and 49 degrees north. A map projection provides a means of representing the curved surfaces of the Earth on a plane surface that coordinate grids that can then be defined and maps drawn. So what this means is that because the regular Mercator map of the world centers around the equator, the UK is quite high up and so rather stretched out top to bottom. As the national grid is only focusing on the UK, they've used the Mercator view of the UK but based it around a much higher latitude to reduce the amount of distortion. Quote, in forming the national grid, the relative positions of points on the grid are altered slightly from their ground positions as a result of using the transverse Mercator projection to account for the curvature of the Earth. Therefore, distances calculated from the national grid coordinates will not, in some cases, agree with the equivalent measured on site. This means despite them using a Mercator focused on the UK to reduce the distortion, it doesn't completely remove the distortion, which can then be a problem for things like surveying where accuracy is paramount. To convert measured distances to projection distances, the measured distance is converted to its equivalent at mean sea level and the scale factor used as follows. Grid distance equals measured distance times scale factor. Now that formula is pretty basic. If you have a scaled down version of something, like a model, you can measure the size of the model, multiply it by the scale of the model, and work out how big the original thing actually is. However, crucially, the book states, quote, the value of the scale factor varies across the country. Now, if the Earth were flat and the map is flat, then the whole map would be a uniform scale. The fact that the flat map has a varying scale across it proves that that map is distorted because it's trying to use a flat plane to display a different shape. They then show how surveyors can calculate an accurate scale factor for their location, the formula of which, again, uses an Earth radius value. We know surveying is incredibly accurate, because if it wasn't, then huge engineering projects wouldn't work. And yet, surveyors are trained to account for curvature of the Earth. If the Earth were flat, then correcting for curvature that didn't exist would completely screw up their data. And yet, OS maps are some of the most accurate maps around, even though they say they're not 100% accurate. I actually managed to find an online PDF version of the latest 5th edition of this book, and being PDF, it allows you to search for specific words. The words curvature or curve appear almost 1400 times throughout the book. Three times specifically stating the phrase earth curvature and once stating earth is curved. The word flat appears 30 times throughout the entire book. The words flat earth or earth is flat appear precisely zero. I mean, it states the word globe more times than that. So... Publicly available training material for surveyors shows that they're taught to account for Earth curvature, and we all know how incredibly accurate surveying is. Which either means that the real world that these people are surveying conforms to their processes of correcting for Earth curvature, or surveyors are all part of the conspiracy, and when you become a surveyor, they let you in on the plot and tell you to ignore everything that you've been taught. Maybe some flat earthers should take a course in surveying and see how that pans out. Anyway, that is going to wrap it up for today. I must say thanks to the professional surveyors who reached out to me about this stuff. And thanks again to Brilliant.org for sponsoring this video. If you've enjoyed this and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. And hopefully we'll see you in the next video.